DNA based, protein okay. based. Okay. All right. So I'm going to switch on my video so that everybody's connection is smooth. And we will start the lecture. So this course is shared together with Dr. Noor Fatmawati, who will teach the second part of this course. The outline for today's presentation begins with RNA, a cosmological perspective. The types of RNA with a focus on non-coding RNAs. Uh, what are non-coding RNA associated diseases? Non-coding RNA based diagnostics, which is the topic of today. And also after that, we'll have a discussion. So this course, yeah, not this course, but this particular session, you will be evaluated for your discussion as well. So I hope everybody will participate and give your comments and input so that I may assign some uh, continuous assessment marks for the discussion in today's class. So discussion will be, of course, uh, maybe asking questions, but also I will give you a sort of a small uh, group assignment at the end of this so that uh, that, will, that will be easier for me to give you marks rather than just uh, random comments. Okay. All right. So uh, from a cosmological perspective, RNA is a very, very old molecule. In this particular figure, uh, it based on scientific evidence, the Earth is about 13.8 billion years or 14 billion years old. So uh, the, our universe is about 14 billion years old. And if we look at Oh, somebody is coming in. So if we look at, uh, if we try to compress 14 billion years into our annual calendar, which just started in January uh, 2024. Oh, so there's some connection problem within, or is it okay? No. Okay, never mind. So, uh, if we compress these 14 billion years into our 365 days calendar, the existence of uh, Homo sapiens is only about uh, roughly one, the last one minute of these 365 days. Okay, so that's a very, very short time. And the planet Earth or solar system started roughly about um, 3 billion years ago, somewhere around October, according September, according to this uh, cosmic calendar. And millions of years are compressed even more into uh, days. So you can see that the dinosaurs uh, were very, oops, the dinosaurs were Dinosaurs were very um, sort of powerful or, big, or they were the top uh, species about 60 million years ago. But then, unfortunately, they could not survive the event of what is believed to be a meteor crash on Earth, which resulted in the extinction of many uh, large-sized dinosaurs, but many smaller animals or mammals survived. And they were able to thrive, which led to uh, more than humans today. Okay. However, uh, nobody knows when or how many billion years ago um, DNA or RNA first came into the picture. So can can you guys uh, type into the chat box which do you think came first, RNA or DNA? Okay, so some people say DNA came first. So you mean came first or discovered first? Uh, came first means that um, based on... Um, oops, I'll then go back. This, this based on... Oh, then this sounds like a chicken and egg question, don't we? Uh, not really. 
Because I mean nobody knows, right? For sure. So what is what is your guess? Okay, so what is uh, everybody's guess? So most people say DNA, some say RNA, some say both. Okay, okay, so there, so which one is a simpler molecule, RNA or DNA? So of course, RNA is a simpler molecule. Got it because it has, um, in terms of chemical complexity, DNA is more complex and let's see if this one can play or not. Okay, however, nobody knows for sure. So it could be that both RNA and DNA came together at the same time uh, or RNA came first or DNA came first. So it could be a chicken and egg question. And because these molecules have existed for at least a few billion years because the earliest organism, uh, microorganism is believed to be uh, sort of found or created about one billion years ago. So that means that even before the existence of bacteria or microorganisms, there should be some molecules that have existed um, even before there are organisms. So these molecules should be even older than one billion years ago. So there is this thing called the primordial soup theory. Um, okay, uh, is this bar blocking the text? No, no. right? No, oh, okay, that's great. So the primordial soup theory tells us that because of the geological condition of Earth billions of years ago, uh, for example, oxygen in the atmosphere was only available was only available when organisms that could uh, create oxygen through photosynthesis existed because before that uh, the atmosphere was more full of methane and other gases so that means that organisms that require oxygen to breathe or to respirate can only appear after the increase of oxygen in the atmosphere so therefore, before life could exist, according to scientific theory, uh, there is a mixture of these chemicals which are found not only on Earth, but also, for example, in meteorites or comets and so on. So scientists believe that these are some of the precursors that lead to the formation of organisms and also molecules that could carry and transfer information. So we have seen that um, if you've looked at the uh, structural components of our DNA, we know that there are many proteins and molecules which helps to compact the DNA itself to better unwind the DNA so that certain other proteins can interact with this DNA to transfer the information into more complex proteins and higher order information so that biological or biochemical um, information can take place. And where does this fall? So all these molecules fall into a very small scale. Okay, so DNA and RNA are essentially in the nanometer range. Um, <clears throat> which is the same size as antibodies and ribosomes and of course viruses. <clears throat> okay, so our focus for today's topic will be in this particular scale. So it's essential to remember or know that uh, these molecules are really, really small. And therefore, how do we uh, capture and analyze these molecules for diagnostic purposes? Okay, we've seen this before, however, we are just going to know that RNA, according to our current understanding, <coughs> is the uh, intermediate step from DNA to messenger RNA and to protein uh, information. 
However, uh, that is just the coding RNA. So coding RNA, I hope you all will know by now, uh, means those RNA that is translated from DNA so that they could then, which are transcribed from DNA so that they could later be translated into proteins. How about non-coding RNA? So could we have a quick type into the chat box? What do you think is the meaning of non-coding RNA? Um, the RNA that is spliced out after the after the splicing, I guess. Mm, yeah, <clears throat> that is uh, possibly one of the meaning of non-coding RNA. So essentially, non-coding RNA. Uh, RNAs which are not from the coding region of genes. So we learned that um, genetic sequences, DNA sequences, has coding regions or open reading frames which codes for proteins. So there are also other sections of DNA which does not have an ORF and it has been discovered that these sections of DNA, although they do not have any ORF, they can carry information or sequences that becomes RNA and they do not get translated into protein. Okay, so our focus today on it's not just on messenger RNA only, but also on other types of RNA. So RNA are uh, not only carrying messages from the DNA, but they are also structurally important because, for example, ribosomal RNA is part of the ribosome. Uh, transfer RNA is is able to carry the amino acids for the construction of a protein. So you have uh, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA somewhere inside here, and messenger RNA as well. And this um, identification of the triplets on the messenger RNA, uh, the transfer RNA will carry the amino acids and continue the building block into a larger protein. So this is the coding RNA here, a non-coding RNA as well here because these are transfer RNAs, right? And also there are other types of RNAs. For example, there are micro RNAs which can silence uh, mRNA, causing it to degrade instead of being uh, translated into proteins. So these are interfering RNAs or RNAIs. And non-coding RNAs can be divided into um, even more small, smaller categories such as housekeeping non-coding RNAs such as ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA, and this is small nuclear RNA, and even uh, smaller uh, RNA. And there are also another category called regulatory non-coding RNAs. So regulatory tells us that they play a role in regulating either gene transcription or protein translation. And there are many, many types such as microRNA, uh, this one is small interfering RNA, uh, pi RNA, and so on. So they are more and more being discovered uh, even up to today. However, these are some of those that are currently well established and they can be even further broken down or separated into those which are small, short, less than 200 nucleotides in length, or long, uh, larger than 200 nucleotides. So most of them are in this very small category. So these are um, um, microRNAs and different types of RNAs. And the biggest one are made of ribosomal RNA, followed by tRNA because, of course, they are important for making proteins and also messenger RNA, right? And different types of RNAs, circular RNAs and so on, uh, comprise different percentages in uh, a uh, human 
uh, from this particular chart. So these are some of the examples. So you don't have to, uh, later I will share this slide with you, of course. Mm. Different RNAs play different roles, as mentioned just now. Uh, some of them are regulatory. Some of them can be involved in antiviral defense. Um, you have uh, this tracer RNA, transactivating CRISPR RNA, which is involved in the CRISPR reaction to sort of chop down foreign DNA that enters bacteria. There are also um, long intergenic non-coding RNAs, which are important for protein scaffolding, which means that helps the protein to form a complex or fold into the proper shape. So these are just many, many examples of uh, non-coding RNAs. And as you know, because of the um, complexity of life science, uh, many people, uh, basically uh, many researchers dedicate some of them just dedicate their life to studying one type of uh, non-coding RNA or different types of non-coding RNA. So here is sort of a graphical representation we can see in the nucleus. There are several types of uh, nucleus. Nucleus means that inside the cell, you have the cytoplasmic region and then you have the inside the nucleus where the genome is. So you have this RNA, small, uh, as small nuclear RNA or um, telomerase RNA, which are located, which are active inside the nucleus. And then you have different types of RNA, such as microRNA, which are active outside the nucleus in the cytoplasmic region. So this is just uh, an overview to let you know that uh, not only are these RNAs different in terms of length and uh, in terms of their properties, like they fall into different shapes, but they also work in different parts of the cell. So RNAs, uh, the non-coding RNAs, essentially play a very uh, wide role yeah, in the cell to regulate and also to help in the everyday functions of the cell, such as housekeeping RNAs. And that gives you an overview of what are the different types of node coding RNAs that are present in the natural uh, biological system in each of our cell. Next, we're going to look at the roles of non coding RNAs and in diseases. So, um, <clears throat> so, of course, uh, cancer is a very common disease, especially in this master's mixed mode program. Um, in the case of cancer, um, different types of um, microRNA can also affect uh, gene expression and thus control. Uh, whether the cell becomes a normal cell. So in this case, if a mature RNA, mature microRNA, which is exported from the DNA into RNA and then get transported out of the nucleus, entering the cytoplasm, and they, con they perform some kind of regulatory control on transcripts, Therefore, this normal control of certain target mRNA will prevent certain protein to be overexpressed or not expressed at all. So in this particular case, this is so-called healthy or normal conditions. However, if there is some kind of mutation or uh, cellular event which prevents this production of microRNA. Therefore, it means that you no longer have this microRNA present in the cell. Therefore, certain oncogene, I, ho I hope you know what is an oncogene by uh, this stage of the course. If not, uh, is there anyone that would like to help to explain what is an oncogene? You can type in the box or speak up 
in the microphone. Uh, I'm using the Zoom like closing the cancer. Sorry, could you uh, repeat? I'm using my airport like any gene like causing the cancer, causing the cell to be uncontrolled or uh, proliferation. Okay. So any gene that uh, may cause a cancer, right? Oncogene. Okay, so I hope everybody can understand that. What is that, oncogene? Um, yeah, so if there is no repression of oncogenes, of a certain oncogene, target oncogene, then you have a uh, Overexpression or high level expression of oncoproteins. So, proteins that may promote the um, growth of uncontrolled growth in the cell. For example, they give the, uh, they say that it could be low apoptosis, which means that cells which are supposed to have died do not die, therefore, they continue to grow uncontrolled. Therefore, you have high cell division invasion and pro proliferation. So those are hallmarks of cancer whereby the cells grow uncontrollably. So another case here whereby if you have uh, too much of mature microRNA, so this microRNA, if there are too many of them, it can also lead to um, low level tumor suppressor protein being expressed. So uh, the cell is basically a homeostasis, right? You need to have um, not too much of something or not too little of something. Therefore, if uh, in this case, this uh, low, this tumor suppressor is kind of um, repressed, then uh, there is not enough to check the um, not enough to check the level of oncogenes. Therefore, again, it leads to uh, low apoptosis and then uncontrolled cell growth. Okay, so this is just one example, a, a general example of how microRNAs plays some kind of important role in uh, uh, the homeostasis of cells. But apart from just cancer, um, MicroRNAs or different types of RNAs, such as long non-coding RNAs, is also important for uh, cellular signaling, meaning that it tells the cells uh, what stage it is. For example, here, you can see that um, in the formation of the heart, from the pluripotent stage to mesodermal and then into the whole organ, so all these long non-coding RNAs, LNC RNAs, uh, have different uh, signaling that will ensure the heart turns into different, uh, the cells turn into different fates such as smooth muscle or endothelial cells. So if it is not correctly expressed and the levels are incorrect, it may lead to cardiovascular disease by just having a wrong morphology or an incorrect morphology. <clears throat> so there are uh, papers which are cited in all the examples given. So I hope you can explore them more on your own. So therefore, as a kind of uh, summary, uh, microRNAs and long non-coding RNAs has been demonstrated to be linked to regulation of gene expression and onset of human diseases, including rare genetic diseases, including uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, rat syndrome, and also beta thalassemia. So this, these are some of the diseases I think we may have uh, gone through use as case studies before. And uh, we can hope that you can see not only are mutations in open reading frames or coding sequences that can affect or cause disease, but also mutations or changes in the sequence of the non-coding region, which actually um, contains the sequences or RNAs, can also affect and cause diseases. So next, 
when we have uh, RNA based um, diseases, or we can then now try to use this as biomarkers to understand or identify what are the RNA or non coding RNA based biomarkers that can be used for diagnostics. So this will be sort of different from uh, transcriptomic based diagnostics. Have, have you uh, gone through the lesson with Dr. Daru, which is covering transcriptomic based diagnostics? Yes, oh, okay, so that's great. So this is a contrast in the sense that now we are focused on non-coding um, RNAs, which means not transcriptomics, but rather looking at those different types of RNA molecules, such as microRNA and so on. So as with uh, standard um, diagnostic methods today, because a lot of our biomolecules come from the blood, therefore we can start by um, collection of the blood. And these days we call it liquid biopsy because um, it is a biopsy that is based, that is using uh, blood, which is liquid, rather than tissues or solid matter. So this is in contrast to the standard biopsy whereby we have to collect uh, specimens by slowly sort of cutting it out from the solid tissue inside. And depending on where this solid tissue is, sometimes it is um, inside the body, therefore it is not easily visualized, you need some kind of um, marker such as radioactivity or some kind of antibodies that can indicate where or some kind of imaging that can tell you where these tissues are located. So in comparison, liquid biopsy, which is becoming uh, more popular today because of its easy collection, everybody, uh, it is easier to collect blood from everyone because you can do that um, in just a few minutes and you do not need to uh, visualize it because you can collect it from our veins and not only can we use the blood to check for those standard markers such as glucose or uh, what else can we check from the blood um, for example, cholesterol level or certain cancer markers, antibodies, which are already being used today. But even more, we have uh, microRNAs and different types of RNAs, which have, of course, needs to be identified first. And that is the crucial step. So the discovery of these microRNAs are important. Uh, discovery of these types of non-coding RNAs are important and in order to ensure that we can use them for diagnosis. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, apart from that, how do we identify this? So some of the methods being used include uh, single cell RNA sequencing. Oh, I see RNA seq. Um, this is um, important because it's been said that there are too many variations in different cells so um, certain um, the technology has allowed us to to sort of study different populations of cells and using and to identify the differences between for example maybe healthy or certain cancer cells so the single cell rna sequencing technology works by the isolation of single cells followed by um, just lysis to extract the RNA. And then you can have this um, RNAs being uh, processed for amplification and then sequencing. So the, all these steps are pretty much standard in RNA work because RNA is very, very low in quantity. And therefore, the amplification and, of course, the reverse transcription into DNA, which is the more stable molecule, is required. 
So after that, we can perform uh, NGS or massively parallel sequencing and analyze this all these different sequences that you find. Okay, so these are sort of standard format, and uh, this is just another overview of how, for example, single cell sequencing is used for uh, in this case analysis of plant tissues. Okay, so. Uh, just the same process again from a tissue we have to isolate single cells and from single cells we have to extract RNA convert into cDNA um, amplify and then sequence and analyze using bioinformatics so that we can see the pattern between different cells okay so before we do the discussion I'm going to show you an example of Again, uh, a case study of a um, real life example of how non coding RNAs can be used to detect diseases. So, uh, using cancer as an example, uh, cancer detection has gone through many stages of evolution. Um, I've shared uh, this story with you where um, you're using the um, BRCA. BRCA1 detection. Um, Angelina Jolie has decided to take uh, medical action. Okay, and this uh, BRCA analysis is based on uh, the open reading frame section of the BRCA gene and looking at certain mutation or many combination of mutations a patient, an individual can be sort of said to be either uh, high risk, mutation positive, or very low risk, which is normal risk, or just if the family, uh, many people is sort of has that particular cancer, then there uh, has that particular maybe information or sequence, then you have a certain higher risk, right? So the risk can also be categorized and broken down into um, different ranges indicating the, the likelihood of developing this disease. But from that, um, nowadays there are also um, the microRNAs that has been shown to be able to diagnose um, breast cancers. So um, in the old days, I think we know that um, micro um, breast cancer is first detected by, for, for example, uh, manual um, or personal sort of symptoms whereby a person, uh, a lady could be maybe one day suddenly feeling alarmed in their breast. Therefore, from there, they may seek uh, medical advice by going to the doctor. But uh, apart from that, uh, there is also where um, okay. So apart from that, uh, there is also the use of uh, mammogram. So I think this may be more popular in Western countries not so much uh, in Malaysia or in Asian countries, whereby um, not the mammogram is not uh, so much uh, a common practice among ladies of certain age. So therefore, another way to encourage uh, more, uh, more, um, how to say, to encourage screening for this such diseases instead of waiting until there is a lump in the chest or the breast which can affect uh, not only um, ladies but also even men. Men can also have breast cancer. Um, it is, has been said that uh, microRNAs can play a big role. Okay, so microRNAs can be obtained from whether uh, different cells and uh, can be obtained through the bloodstream. Okay, so these are just the examples showing how these microRNAs get traveled into the bloodstream from different types of cells. 
Okay, so let's look at microRNAs in clinical application from the discovery to its use. So this is a, a talk given by uh, Professor Tu from NUS uh, several years ago at uh, Inform when he attended one of our conferences here. So he provided and shown us a evidence-based approach for identifying circulatory bi microRNA biomarkers using liquid biopsy. So he told us whether this is uh, achievable or not, whether it's practical, can we use it? And also some of the lessons learned from his uh, research. So we've seen that just now liquid biopsy is simply from a blood sample um, in more advanced uh, medical settings with molecular capabilities. We will not only use it for checking, you know, our annual cholesterol checks or blood, uh, whether we, are, we have a high blood or whether we have certain markers for maybe um, such as for nowadays using blood, you can test for, um, let me think, for like, <clears throat> for men it will be like prostate cancer, where you have certain markers which are high and can be indicative, and also for other types of cancer, of course. Um, however, if we are able to tap into this non-coding RNAs, we are able to get a lot of information more together with um, those other standard biomarkers that we have today, including uh, proteomics and DNA and transcriptomics. Okay, so non-coding RNAs or RNA-based diagnostics are one part of them, which can help us to achieve more bigger coverage. So you have traditional tumor biomarkers, which are protein biomarkers, this CA, 19-9, CA125, and so on. Um, from DNA biomarkers, we can identify mutations. And of course, certain diseases are very well established uh, due to these mutations and, and even uh, epigenetic uh, changes. However, we can still have more room or more areas to cover from non-coding RNA. Okay, and to do all that, we need to do all that. Uh, we can collect the blood. Okay, and from blood, oops, and from blood, we can um, extract and separate the different uh, molecules so that we can use them for um, discovery of these different biomarkers. And over time, we can use the bioinformatics pipeline to um, have a bigger profile of not only those uh, standard diseases that are covered today. Okay, so this is a paradigm shift because it means that we are no longer just looking at RNA as the important molecule for um, messaging uh, the intermediate messenger between DNA and protein, but we look at them as an important molecule whereby non-coding RNAs act as regulators of gene expression. So I've, I've shown you just now that there are many types of RNAs that play different roles at different locations of the cell and some of them are released into the bloodstream and from there we are able to capture and identify those types of uh, free floating RNAs in the blood. So we are going to focus on microRNA in this particular talk and what are microRNAs? So microRNAs are said to be those RNAs which are about less than maybe uh, 30 nucleotides in length. 
So far, there are said to be about 2,000 mature human microRNAs that have been discovered. I'm sure because this talk was in 2017, so I think by now there are more than 2,000 microRNAs identified. In comparison, uh, messenger RNAs can be about 1.4 kilobases in length. Right, so um, these microRNAs have been identified to be important in various different um, disease spaces, such as for cancer, cardiovascular, diabetes, uh, immunology, neuroscience, and viral, and so on. So as of uh, 2017, there are many clinical trials, hundreds of them already started uh, by various pharma companies. And as, as I think you can understand now, the reason why it is uh, being pursued is because, again, just by from the blood liquid biopsy instead of the normal traditional tissue solid-based biopsy, we are able to screen for almost a lot of diseases known to mankind from these microRNAs. So it is kind of like a gold mine because not many people uh, have discovered important or key microRNAs for various diseases. So these are kind of the um, example of how microRNAs can be transported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm and then how it gets uh, released during the, for example, apoptosis of the cell and so on. And as mentioned just now, it can cause cancer by disruption of regulation of oncogenes, or it can prevent the um, it can prevent the suppressor proteins, those proteins that suppress oncogenes to be uh, stopped from being expressed and then leading again to high expression of oncogenes. So it, the regulatory roles for microRNAs are really important to prevent cancer. So in terms of um, breast cancer high-risk screening, um, we know that <clears throat> um, patients usually are late to the clinic because the common symptom is some kind of uh, physical lump okay, in the breast tissue area. However, if we are able to use uh, blood-based, for example, maybe annual screening, uh, screening just once a year from the blood while you are also doing your health screen for other common health markers, therefore you are able to cover many more people instead of waiting for the physical symptom to appear. And mammograms are the sort of uh, standard uh, way to um, <clears throat> detect breast cancer. However, um, one of the sort of downsides are that uh, different populations of humans have different um, morphology of uh, the breast tissues. For example, Asians are different than Caucasians. And also, there are overdiagnosis resulting in unnecessary biopsies and also quality of life. So, so although this is working uh, in some populations, maybe it works better in Caucasian populations, but uh, it is very costly and again not many people uh, go to do it voluntarily so in order to do this to allow the use of microRNA for the detection of um, early stage breast cancer uh, they need to screen and compare between healthy and uh, stage one breast cancer patients so this has been discovered in the at first true biomarker discovery, biomarker validation, and then uh, true clinical validation. So these are the standard three steps of biomarker discovery up to clinical validation. Started with a small number of uh, European cohort. Uh, these are the number of peoples that. Um, 
uh, enroll for this uh, clinical testing in the beginning. So in Europe, just 120 people. But once they are able to validate that there is some information or data, then you need to continue testing more and more. So they included Asian population as well, because now you want to ensure that the microRNA is universal and is able to cover all human beings and not just, you know, uh, either in aid, not just that it works in Europe or in the Western countries, but also works in uh, Asia and also other parts of the world as well. So it started with just hundreds and then once they have uh, more validation, they increase the number of individuals enrolled to more than 5,000. And it is interesting that at the same time, the microRNA candidates started were about 600. So I remember that uh, there were about 2,000 uh, known microRNAs. Uh, they started with 600 and then over time, they were able to uh, limit or uh, rule out more than um, how many percent is this? About uh, two percent. Twenty-four out of six hundred. So, <clears throat> so at the moment they have an assay that requires less than twenty-four microRNAs for use to screen uh, this thousands of population. So are circulating microRNA biomarkers cancer specific? Okay, so according to their study, they were able to find that uh, there are certain microRNAs which are upregulated and they play a role in different types of cancer. So you have breast cancer, which are here, some which are specific only for breast cancer. So if an individual has, you know, certain types of microRNA, then it is indicative that likely they may have more than just one type of cancer. Or some biomarkers which are sort of indicative of uh, more than one type of cancer. And some are down-regulated microRNAs as seen here, which is, so it means that you need to look at different types of microRNA in terms of their upregulation and downregulation, and they can tell, they can be used for uh, the same diagnostic purposes. So in order to um, identify these microRNAs, um, they have used a simple um, PCR test so they say that uh, designing the microRNA is demanding because of the thousands and then you have to cut down and identify the few which are very specific. It is a, however, once you have, you are able to do that, it is essentially a qPCR reaction. So does anyone know what is a qPCR? Can you tell me? in the chat box or in it's qualitative pcr like quantify and detect the gene that being expressed in the reaction okay yes <clears throat> so you, it is a quantitative pcr where yeah. you can yeah you can measure the co number of copies of the um of the rna Okay, in DNA form because it will be reverse transcribed and then amplified. So it is um, a kind of uh, simple in the sense once you are able to get uh, the identified microRNA to be confirmed or validated to be true to identify that particular kind of cancer. And also it must be uh, compliant to the requirements of certain um, quality checking uh, bodies and also medical agencies. So these are standard uh, workflows where you have to have a good experimental design and we'll look into detail on that after this. So now, how do we 
uh, do this if you want to do this for different types of diseases. So it is essential that, of course, it starts with the correct sample collection, uh, proper and standardized RNA extraction. So, so although that um, I said that uh, you can just do liquid biopsy, you know, collect the blood and it is um, the same for everyone. But however, how do you ensure that uh, the levels of microRNA that is present in one person is sort of uh, the same in different populations? How do you standardize that? So that is why it is essential that they need to do some kind of um, standardization or normalization in the beginning, whereby they need to ensure at first that the extraction protocol is correct. Because even if we were to perform the extraction, I think you will know by now when you have done your practical um, components, uh, different groups may have different results. For example, either transformation or doing... Have you guys done ELISA? Uh, plate ELISA test. Yes, okay. So even if you do ELISA, for example, you're handling, you're puppeting, uh, different individuals carrying it out in different labs will give you different results. Maybe it might, di might differ in terms of maybe just a few points or on, on a few different optical, uh, optical density measurement, absorbance measurement, but still those are differences. So when it comes to diagnosis, it is very important that not only are uh, the biomarkers correct, but also the uh, samples are treated correctly. Okay, so essentially uh, it is best to be as automated as possible to ensure that the extraction process is uh, the same throughout the world, wherever you are carrying it out so that the results can be input, interpreted correctly. So this is the first step to ensure that there is some kind of establishment of the sample by extraction, by you know having a quality checking, by spiking with known uh, values, known concentrations of RNA, and so on. Okay, so this is the first step. So you need to normalize all this so that uh, different individuals, different populations of um, humans eating different kinds of food, uh, living in different parts of the world, whether it's uh, winter or summer and so on, whenever they carried out this test, um, the levels of RNA is normalized. The second step is essentially the crucial step. Once you have your samples, treated correctly. Next, uh, you need to now ensure that the microRNA detection or analytics or qPCR is also accurate. So here again, because this step is the amplification of that initial sample that you've extracted, so this amplification step needs to be correct as well. And you need to ensure that the sample can be uh, processed. So you need to reduce sample to sample variation or even pipetting variation by different lab technicians in different parts of the world. Uh, assay variation whereby the kit that has been used um, <clears throat> is um, correct as much as possible. So all this needs to be checked and some kind of quality control has to be built in to ensure that when we use different PCR instruments, for example, the variation is taken care of. And the third step is whereby after you have all this, uh, the data needs to be processed. So the data are essentially the qPCR curves. Um, I think this one will involve the bioinformatics processing so that now when you have thousands of data, how are you going to 
uh, ensure that all this data is analyzed uh, quickly and correctly. So it's not just uh, one or two samples, but when you have thousands of samples, it has to be analyzed, uh, not individually or manually, but by some kind of computer program that it works always at the same uh, kind of uh, con condition or parameters. So using that, um, he showed that, yes, uh, they were able to identify a certain uh, microRNA using that, that is shown here where they have a good correlation uh, of the expected disease. So this is the end of uh, Prof 2 slide. Okay. <clears throat> and before I proceed to the next section, I think that uh, either I can take some questions or um, we can take a short break and continue in 10 minutes. So any questions? If not, we will take a 10 minute break so that we will continue at 7.10. Okay, all right.
Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's continue for a little bit more and then we'll break again for your discussion. So uh, this is an overview of just the entire process of how we can, you know, discover, validate and use the microRNAs or other non-coding RNAs for clinical applications. So for example, this is another example using cardiovascular disease. Um, at first, you need to identify the people or the individuals with this type of background of or disease. Therefore, once you have identified the population that carries that particular um, biomarker that you want, then you may collect blood from those individuals that fit the criteria and then do a, perform a liquid biopsy using, you know, usually qPCR use, <clears throat> to find out if what microRNAs are upregulated or downregulated. Once you have this kind of profile, you may validate whether your findings are correct or not through a preclinical study on small animals. Uh, there are various disease models of mouse that are available. And once this has been established in animals, you may be continued to a larger animal or human trials. And therefore, finally, this um, identified and validated Biomarkers can be can be used for diagnostics and pronostics from blood or other fluid samples. So this is a video showing um, the company that Prof2 has started up. Not sure if you can view it or not. So we have developed a platform technology that can measure these very small molecules called microRNA. Our assay is very sensitive, it's ultra sensitive, and that allows us to discover markers for different diseases with small sample size. So gastrocle is actually a test that can tell you whether you have early stage gastric cancer. What we have established is the world's first standard for microRNA diagnostics. Our know-how to optimize and produce biomarkers have allowed us to work very closely with ASA in the early days of the pandemic to roll out a lot of test kits. We can produce then very quickly ramp up to hundreds of thousands to millions. And that not only serves Singapore, then we begin to distribute around the world. And today, this product is rolled out to more than 45 countries around the world. The proudest thing to me is actually to see how we have developed talent. The core of Rexus, they're all our students from the university, a totally homegrown company. It's a collective effort of a lot of people who are talented, they're young, they're hungry. And it is this group of people who begin to explore new evidence. In R&D, what you're essentially doing is writing your own syllabus and you're creating new knowledge. There is no textbook form. There's no book to tell us what to do. We never thought what we did in a lab translated into a business. It is not about money. It's simply about making an impact. Where is a global village? We cannot do things just addressing the needs of Singapore alone. Innovation must not stop in Singapore. Innovation must be global. Okay, so if you would like to find out more, you can also visit their website called merxus.com where they have uh, developed and is currently selling a number of kits for screening uh, different types of diseases using liquid biopsy. So that's the end of the my presentation. However, um, there is some small activity that we have to do today before we finish our session. So the class discussion is to discuss through an example the application of non-coding RNA 
you can use either microRNA or any other non-coding RNA for the diagnosis of a disease. Okay, so this will be done by small groups, either of three or four persons. So it could be a group of three, 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 or three, three, four. I think a group of two is too small, so it's better if there are at least three persons. And uh, perhaps the last group could be four. Uh, so do you have your team members already? Do you know who you would like to work with? I'll give you about, how long do we need? I think just half an hour, right? So I'll give you about half an hour. You can discuss in your groups. Um, do you want me to assign or you can, I think I can just do a group breakout. Let me see. Do you know what the assignment is, everyone? Uh, doctor, if you explain for us, it's going to be much better. Okay, so you will break into groups, right? Um, <clears throat> about three groups. Group of three, group of three and one group of four. Or if you want, you can be, I don't know. Yeah, two is too small, so that will end up with too many groups so you will discuss in the in the group about one example you need to search on PubMed or Google Scholar what examples of micro RNA or any other non-coding RNA that can be used for the diagnosis of a disease so I'll give you the time to search for this article. So it will be sort of like a case study as we have done previously, except this one is more briefly. So you will, after the half an hour, you will come back and you will pre. You can. Uh, <clears throat> so how do we share with each other? I think the only way to share is by just a simple one slide presentation. So too many slides, then it becomes um, too many things. So I think one slide is enough. Okay, so you will discuss among yourselves and then come up with a one slide summary showing your the what is the known coding RNA that you have uh, found or identified from some publication that is used for the diagnosis of a certain disease. Sorry, Dr. Like, is it okay like choosing only one paper, like working on only one disease? Yeah, one paper is okay. enough. Okay, Tim. Thank you. Okay. Now let me try to break out. Okay, let me stop this presentation. Enable breakout session, number of breakout sessions, three to four, okay. <clears throat> Doctor, one slide? Uh, yes, one slide is okay. Okay. So you can try to cover the things that I've mentioned just now, for example, discovery. There are four stages, right? discovery and then the processing and then the validation well, let me share this once more before we break up okay i'm going to create the breakout session So you have breakout session one. It's not where is the chat box? Oh. 
so yin and uh, yo leo kavita yo leo kavita okay leo kavita okay e n Sana Sultana Doctor, can you share again what's the title? Okay, I'll share once more. So your presentation should cover this, this right? Your discussion, sorry, not presentation, but just your summary should briefly discuss, you know, uh, what sample is used? What, is it what kind of liquid, blood, or urine, or whatever? And then, um, how is it performed? Is it qPCR or other kind of PCR? Um, some bioinformatics, and what are the biomarkers that were identified? So I'll just discuss an example how we can use non-coding RNA to apply it for diagnosis of a disease. Okay, is that okay for everyone? Wait, the title. Okay, okay, wait, need to need to screenshot this. Okay, I just copy. I just copy into the chat box. Okay, so you can start and then we'll meet back at eight o'clock.